How do Berkshire and Berkshire companies protect themselves against lawsuit-happy lawyers, and is it possible for American businesses to survive the financial and time-consuming costs of dealing with lawyers? Well, it's a good question, and we've, we've probably had less litigation than any company that, you know, with a $25 billion market value in America. But, uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, and, and we, we were sued one time at Blue Chip Stamps. What was it for, Charlie? Uh, uh, how many billion by some guy? That, <laughs> Lots. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, they're, they're, you, you, you cannot protect yourself against lawsuits, and there, uh, there are, um, there's certainly a lot of frivolous ones. We've, like I say, we have, we, it's not been a drain on our time or money, but particularly time uh, to date, and uh, I think one thing you'd have to do is, that if, if you ran into anything of that sort, you would uh, you would not pay, and you would make life as try to make life comparably difficult for the other party as they made it for you. But that has not been our experience so far, Charlie. You know? Yeah, well, I can tell an Omaha story on that one, which demonstrates the Berkshire Hathaway technique for minimizing lawsuits. When I was a very young boy, I said to my father who was a practicing lawyer here in Omaha, why do you do so much work for X, who was an overreaching blowhard, and so little work for Grant McFadden, who was such a wonderful man? And my father looked at me as though I was slightly slow in the head, and he said, Charlie, he said, Grant McFadden treats his employees right, his customers right, everybody right. When he gets involved with somebody who's a little nuts, he gets up from his desk and walks to where they are and extricates himself as soon as he can. And he says, Charlie, a man like Grant McFadden doesn't have enough law business to keep you in school. <laughs> ah, but X, he said. He's a walking minefield of continuous legal, legal troubles. And he's a wonderful client for a lawyer. Now, my father was trying to teach me, and I must say it worked beautifully because I decided that I would adopt the Grant McFadden approach. And uh, I would argue that Warren independently reached the same approach very early in life. Boy, has that saved us a lot of trouble. That is a, it is a good system. You can't, you, we basically have the attitude that you can't make a good deal with a bad person. And you can, and that means you just, we just forget about it. I mean, we don't try and protect ourselves by contracts or getting into all kinds of, uh, you know, due diligence, or it just we just forget about it. We we we, we're, we're, we can do fine over over time dealing with people that we like and admire and trust. So we we have never, and a lot of people do get the idea because the the the, the bad actor will tend to try and tantalize you in one way or another, and uh, uh, you won't win. It uh, it just pays to avoid them, uh, and I. I we started out with that with that attitude, and you know maybe one or two experiences have convinced us even more so that that's the, the way to the way to play the game. I think that most companies, when they do acquisitions, would feel the need to do a significant amount of legal due diligence to do things like check the leases, check into things like undisclosed environmental liability or perhaps threatened litigation. And I guess my question is, have you ever been burned by your approach? We've never been burned by the, the we, we've been burned only in the sense that we've made mistakes on judging the future economics of the business, which would have had nothing to do with due diligence. We regard, we regard what people normally refer to due diligence as, as really sort of boilerplate in most cases. It's a process that big companies go through and they feel they have to go through it and they're ignoring Oftentimes, in our view, they're ignoring what really counts, which is evaluating the people they're getting in with it and evaluating the economics of the business. That's 99% of the deal. You know, you may run into an environmental liability problem, you know, one time in a in a hundred, or you may, you know, you may find a bad lease. I asked Melvin about, you know, do you have any bad leases? I mean, that's the easiest way to do it. And uh, I can read them all and try and look for every clause or something, but it isn't going to, you know, it, that is not the problem. We've made bad, lots of bad deals. We made a bad deal when we bought Hoshul Cone, for example, a department store operation back in 1966. 
but it had fine people, but we were wrong on the economics of the business. But the leases didn't make any difference, or, you know, that sort of thing just was not important. And I can't recall any time that what other people referred to as due diligence would have avoided a bad deal for us. I can't either. No, that's 30-some years. And I, the key thing, you just don't want to do, I go into, I'm on various public company boards, I've been on 19 public company boards, and, you know, their idea of the due diligence is to send the lawyers out and have a bunch of investment bankers come in and make presentations and all that, and I regard that as terribly diversionary, because the board sits there, you know, entranced by all of that, and everybody reporting how wonderful this thing is, and how they've checked out patents and all that sort of thing, and nobody is focusing really on where the business is going to be in five or ten years. And, you know, business judgment about economics, and people to some extent, but the business economics, that is 99 percent of deal making, and the rest, people may do it for their protection. I think too often they do it as a crutch, just to go through with a deal that they want to go through with anyway, and of course all the professionals know that, so believe me, they come back with the diligence whether due or not, and we are not big fans of that. We have, I don't know how many deals we've made over the years, but I cannot think of anything that traditional due diligence has had a thing to do with. No, we've had surprises on the favorable side a couple of times. That is true. That is true. The kind of people that we've generally dealt with have usually told us the bad things first and good things after we made the deal. We made a deal with a fellow over in Rockford in 1969, Eugene Abegg, the Illinois National Bank and Trust Company. I made that deal in a couple of hours, and I mean, there just wasn't any way that Gene was going to be hiding anything bad. For the next ten years when I went over there, every time I'd go to lunch, he'd point out some building in town that we owned that wasn't on the books or some foundation we had that had money in it that he hadn't told me about, and he even gave me some bills, one of which I carry in my pocket, that he had still sitting around with the, that were issued by the bank, that were our own money, which he never told me about. He had them, we could cut them out like paper dolls. I mean, Gene was not a guy to show all his cards. And those are the kind of people we've generally dealt with, and I would certainly say that the, that Melvin and Shirley fit that description in spades.